This is our second session on Galatians 3, 15 to 18, and I promised last time that we would focus on verse 16, which treats the Old Testament word seed in a peculiar way. Now the promises were made to Abraham and to his seed, or his offspring. It does not say, and to seeds, referring to many, but referring to one, and to your seed, who is Christ. And the reason that matters to Paul is because he has just said in verse 14, the verse before this unit, in Christ, in Christ Jesus, the blessing of Abraham comes to the the nations, the Gentiles, so that we might receive the promised Spirit through faith. In other words, Paul is laboring to explain how all the, the nations who are not Jews by birth can be heirs of the Abrahamic promise or covenant. And his answer is Jesus Christ, and in him we become heirs of Abraham because Jesus is the seed. That's, that's what he's doing. The question for us, however, in this session is, how does he do that? How, how can he move from a singular seed, which really does refer to many people, to Christ? So, Father, as we Labor to get inside Paul's head here. Would you guide us and open our minds to the way he read the Old Testament and help us to see its wisdom and insightfulness so that we can join him in his faith and his celebration of our participation as Gentiles in Christ the seed and thus the promises made to Abraham, including justification by faith, and the Holy Spirit himself. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, the promises were made to Abraham and to his seed. For example, Genesis 13. And all the land that you see, I will give to you and to your seed. Hebrew seed, Greek seed, forever. I will make your seed as the dust of the earth, so that if one can count the dust of the earth, your seed also can be counted. So it's very clear that in the Old Testament, this seed, singular, includes so many people, it's like the dust on the earth. And so Paul seems to be playing fast and loose with the vocabulary or the grammar by saying it doesn't say seeds, referring to many, when in fact seed does refer to many on the face of it. So we got to figure out what, why does Paul draw attention to the fact that this word is singular, even though it refers to many, and he makes much of that in drawing attention to the fact that the singularity of it points to Christ the final and decisive singular seed. What, what, where does he see clues in the Old Testament that that's a legitimate move? And we know that Paul is not stupid. He's not uh, seeing less than we see. In fact, he's seeing more than we see. We know that he understands the word seed in its plural meaning. Here, here's Romans 4.16. That is why it depends on faith in order that the promise may rest on grace and be guaranteed to all his seed, all his seed, not only to the adherent of the law, but also to the one who shares the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. This, he knows good and well that this word seed refers to many people. It's a corporate a singular noun, like we would say crowd, 
And we know that crowd is a singular noun, but it always refers to a lot of people in the crowd. Here's what we do know about the way Paul is thinking. Here's Galatians 3, 28 and 29. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is no male or female, for you're all one in Christ Jesus, in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ's, you then are Abraham's seed, heirs according to the promise. So the key for a Gentile to be a seed and thus an heir of the promise made to Abraham is that we are in Christ and thus belong to the seed Christ. That's the way he's thinking. Here's Galatians 3, 6 to 8 to show that he's very aware that Gentiles are in the covenant or in uh, are heirs of the promise because of what was promised to Abraham. Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. Know then that it is those of faith who are sons of Abraham, those of faith who are sons of Abraham. That includes Gentiles. The scripture foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham, saying, In you shall all the nations be blessed. So in you shall all the nations be blessed. So Paul is trying to explain how it is that Gentiles can participate in being part of this seed. And his answer is that the seed ultimately refers to Christ, and in Christ, the nations who were promised to be heirs in the Old Testament are now full fledged sons of Abraham and thus heirs of Abraham. They are seed because of Christ. What clues did Paul see in the Old Testament that this seed had a narrow meaning leading to a singular Christ? Let's go here first. Here's Genesis 21, 12. God said to Abraham, through Isaac, and in the context he means not Ishmael, through Isaac, not your offspring or seed Ishmael, shall your seed be named. That's just massively important because Paul's going to pick up on it and really do something amazing with this verse. So Paul sees already in the Old Testament that God is narrowing the word seed, right? Your seed shall be named or called through Isaac, not Ishmael. In other words, not all physical offspring are offspring. So Paul spots a narrowing. He didn't make it up. He didn't import it. He sees that the word seed, even though it's plural, is being reduced to those who are called seed. Now let's watch what he does with this in Romans 9. It's not as though the word of God has failed, the fact that so many Jews are unbelieving. For not all are descended, not all who are descended from Israel belong to Israel. Not all are children of Abraham because they are his seed. But through Isaac, now this is the quotation of 21.12, Genesis 21.12. He quotes it. Through Isaac shall your seed be named. This means that it is not the children of the flesh. In other words, not everybody born to Abraham, which you might call seed, are in fact the children of God, the heirs of the promise. But the children of promise are counted. 
oops, I didn't mean to circle children, counted, (laughs) counted as seed, just like the seed here is named. For the promise said, this time next year I will return and Sarah will have a son. Not Hagar having Ishmael, but Sarah will have a son and he'll be your seed. The child of promise, the child of God. And not only so, now he's going to go further and show that this idea of narrowing continues with Rebekah. But also when Rebekah had conceived children by one man, our forefather Isaac, so this is the next generation, Rebekah and Isaac conceive, and they conceive and they have Jacob and Esau in her womb. Though they were not yet born and had done nothing good or bad, in order that God's purpose of election might continue, not because of works, but because of him who calls, and that word call is the same as that word named, she was told, the older will serve the younger. As it is written, Jacob I loved, but Esau I hated. So, Isaac, not Ishmael, Jacob, not Esau. That's what Paul sees. There is a narrowing. So let's put it like this. Paul sees two things. One, the true seed of Abraham come into being by a a naming or a counting, or a a calling, or an electing. You see these words right here, naming, counting, calling, electing. In other words, it is not automatic to be physically born of Abraham. It's not automatic to be the true seed. There is a, a narrowing down by naming, counting, calling, electing. And here's the second thing that Paul sees. The true seed involve a narrowing. In other words, this act of naming and counting and calling and electing result in a smaller group than if everybody born of Abraham were called his seed. And Paul now has a crucial issue to solve. If things are getting narrower like this, And someday the Gentiles are going to be included in this seed. Something has to change. If it's going to get narrower and then get wider, what has to happen? And Paul's answer is Christ. Let me put it here like this. So here's Abraham. And the notion is that everybody born here to Abraham is the seed of Abraham. And then there's this progressive narrowing by naming, counting, calling, electing. And over here is all the nations shall be blessed in Abraham. How can all these nations be included in the blessing of the seed of Abraham when this is getting narrower and narrower, and the answer is Christ. So here's my conclusion for how Paul is thinking back in our text. Now, the promises were made to Abraham and to his seed. It does not say to seeds, but referring to many, but referring to one and to your seed, Christ. I think Paul looked at the entirety of the Old Testament story 
about how the nations were to be brought into full inclusion in Abraham's blessing, Abraham's inheritance, justification by faith and the Holy Spirit and life. And he saw that the Old Testament itself was giving all the clues necessary. There was a narrowing down from the seed in the electing, the calling, the counting of Isaac, not Ishmael, and Jacob, not Esau, and then through the rest of the Old Testament, only the elect, a remnant, were saved, and that remnant comes to its climax in Christ, and he infers that because Christ is the only possible way that the Gentiles, the nations, could be counted as seed because they are united to Christ. So it's a fairly elaborate and complex sequence of thought that Paul goes through, but I think if we give him the benefit of the doubt, that's the way he read the Old Testament, and that's how he warranted this understanding of seed. 